Hi everyone, I'm Simon Elwin. I'm one of the researchers at the conference. Uh, thanks for sticking around. I think this is one of the last talks of the conference. So today I'm talking to you about this, well, it's a bit of a mouthful of a title. We tend to think of it as, we call it Sea Searcher's Very Awesome Adventure to Vima, or more technically it's Jack's adventure because he got to go and the rest of us stuck in the office. So how exactly did a small NGO from Cape Town get involved with one of the largest groups in the world? Well, Greenpeace were running this Protect the Oceans from Pole to Pole campaign, uh, highlighting or, or campaigning for improved high seas legislation, particularly in remote areas like Vima, where ghost fishing can be an issue. And that was one of the, the sort of goals of this mission, highlighting go, uh, ghost fishing. They were keen to get local scientists involved in each of the campaigns and keen to piggyback science on the campaigning. And so we were very keen to get involved in an interesting part of the world. And most importantly, from our point of view, also that we got paid, uh, which helped get us through a rather challenging year of lockdown. So where exactly is Vima? Well, you should be here in Stellenbosch, just to the east of Cape Town. Vima is almost exactly a thousand kilometers west of us and about halfway to the Valfus Ridge, which is a quite extensive underwater mountain range. Other features in the area, you have Tristan and Gough Island, British territories, and the Norwegian territory of Bouvet Island down here. So very much an isolated, a very isolated part of the ocean and, and there's very little background information that is more recent than historic whaling data. So what do we know about the cetaceans in this area? Starting with humpback whales, uh, these are a species that have recovered very well from whaling. They've been well studied down here in the south, uh, southwestern Cape where we have what is now supergroup feeding, but it's been a, a long known feeding ground of the Western Cape, the animals moving up into the Angola and Gabon for their wintering and all the way down to the Antarctic, presumably. And some of the animals we know from satellite tagging in Gabon, that was done in around the early 2000s, the Howard Rosenbaum and Bruce Mate, that some of these animals are actually following the Volfus Ridge down, sort of to the west of Vima. More recently, more recently, our colleagues, um, Ducia Camilla and team at Department of Environmental Affairs, tagged some humpback whales going up the east coast here. And then they threw the textbook away. These whales went, turned around and went up the west coast into the southeast Atlantic. So we're dealing with three potential migration routes of humpback whales off the Volfus Ridge, down continental west coast and down the continental shelf in the east coast with Vima sitting in the middle. And we thought it could be really cool to, to pick up some song here that might reflect uh, west coast or east coast population origins. And there's evidence from other populations that humpback whales might be using seamounts as navigation stations. So we thought, well, actually, Vima could be a really cool area if we're picking up animals that are, that are using uh, some, some sort of third or fourth migration route. Well, the Cape is, of course, most famous for its southern right whale watching. During the winter months, the animals are breeding along the bays in the south coast here. Um, and we know from satellite tagging done by Bruce Mate and Peter Best in the early 2000s, that when the animals leave the coast, they head in the southwest west direction, uh, down towards Bouvet Island, which is a feeding ground. But a number of the animals seem to have a stopover point east of Tristan de Cuna, not far from Vima. So that's just a few of them. We thought, well, who knows, maybe we're going to get some Vima seamounts showing up as an important uh, stopover area for southern right whales. So the Balaenoptrid whales that we have off the southeast Atlantic, well, we have Brutus whales. We actually have two stocks in southern Africa around South Africa than inshore stock, which is endangered, uh, which we were unlikely to see, stays on the continental shelf. And this offshore population, which moves north and south, like all the baleen whales do, uh, migrate seasonally. It's just its southern limit is here off Western South Africa. So uh, very little known about this population in terms of abundance. They were, they were hit quite hard by whales, while whaling. So quite exciting for us if, if we'd see some of these guys. The other thing we'd expect to see out here is say whales. We know from Peter Best and Christina Lockyer's uh, nice paper in 2002, there were a high distribution of whaling catches. These were from shore-based whalers. So we expect they were coming in and out of this harbor here. So we expect certainly more animals offshore of this. So we would definitely be expecting some say whales. Also, no idea about sort of recovery from whaling. So any data from this part of the ocean, really interesting. Then the big guys, the blue and the fin, and the, the well, the mink is quite small, actually. There's no sort of neat summary papers of, of whaling catches from this part of the world. Uh, this is more, they more tend, tend to be studied more globally, but there has been some really good passive acoustic work done recently by the Germans. This is Tomish, Carolyn Tomishadel paper. That was uh, up at Wagner Institute off north of the Balfish Ridge. And then you heard Fanny Shibangu talk uh, about some of the extensive number of papers that he's recently been publishing which includes blue fin and minke whales. So we're getting some good idea of the timing of whales, uh, blue fin and minkies in this part of the world. 
And the short version is with our cruise in November, we, uh, most of these pieces should be heading south, but we'd expect some acoustic presence. So in combination, when you actually sort of lay this all on top of each other and think, well, what do we have? We have a feeding area down here near Brutus, uh, near Puve Island for right and humpback whales. We have the stopover for right whales. We have three different potential humpback whale tracks. We have uh, the offshore Brutus whale population. We have say whale catches just west of Cape Town. Uh, really, so there, there, there's quite a lot going on in the area, but you notice Vima's kind of sitting there in the middle of all of this, in the middle of everywhere, but also in the middle of nowhere. So we were convinced we were either going to see everything or nothing. So what did we do? Well, we used visual surveys. We, we'd hoped to have at least two observers on the vessel, but in the end it was just one. So Jack followed us with a similar protocol to what seismic survey observers use. Uh, so two hours on, half an hour off, something like that. And we had moored cloud traps, and there was also a um, towed hydrophone array that was uh, that was deployed. Although we haven't analysed that data, that's um, that's uh, speak to Kirsten about that if you're interested in that information. This is a 3D model of the Vima Seamount itself, uh, produced by the Norwegians working on the Friedrich Nansen. It's very much a cone with a plateau top about eight kilometers by 11 kilometers and hovering around 50 to 100 meters uh, depth. We deployed our hydrophones, one on the west side and one on the east side using a buoyed system with a surface buoy. And now to the results. Well, for us, the most important hydrophone uh, result was that Jack got the hydrophones back. He's not faking that level of happiness. Uh, he was under a lot of pressure to make sure he didn't lose those hydrophones. A couple of quick slides here on the visual results. 14 days, 39 encounters, mostly unidentified baleen whales. You can see why here, if you don't control the course of the ship, you tend to end up with a lot of blows on the horizon that you can't really identify. Several humpbacks, fins say, and surprisingly, zero dolphins. So this is what the cruise track looked like, zoomed out, zoomed in, and then just a close-up of the Vima area. The effort is in dark gray, and the colored dots represent various cetaceans. Just note there was a sort of dog leg halfway back to Cape Town and back to the Seamount to do a crew change. The most interesting area is this box here, where we had fully 21 sightings on a single day, mostly of fin whales, which have this distinctive uh, backward slope dorsal fin, but also a couple of say whales, which have a more erect dorsal fin. We did have Joe Wells, we Jack saw a couple of humpbacks feeding at this seamount, but actually very few humpbacks on the whole, considering the high numbers seen off the Cape at the same time. And again, the highlight here, no dolphins, which is quite unusual. So this is why you're all here, the acoustic results, of course, a very uh, useful technique because a lot of the time cetaceans are really hard to see. So first set of results, we produced these long-term spectrograms, which we find are a really useful way of summarizing uh, long-term data. Uh, very clear diurnal cycles on both the east and the west side. And uh, there's a lot of reef noise on the east, uh, significant ship noise. Uh, there was actually the, um, the, the Arctic sunrise itself. We did have some rubbing on the moorings and, and some strumming noises, which were kind of hard to avoid with the mooring design we used. And we definitely picked up some fish vocalizing as a, the ship noise. So overall, uh, useful. We, we found this a very good way of uh, finding dolphin echolocation because it really shows up in, in bands very nicely on this. Now to the whales. First up, humpback whale. We did detect some at, at the uh, at Vima itself. Uh, very few, surprisingly. So if you look at the graph at the top here, the colors um, give you the sort of time of day dark blue or yellow is at night and greeny colors are in the day. Uh, we're pretty confident about this. Uh, we've seen a lot of non-song and song vocalizations for Southern Africa. So this isn't the greatest spectrogram, but that's kind of what we picked up. Uh, distant, quiet, non-song sounds, no song recorded, which is which we were a little bit surprised by given how much song we record, we've been recording off South Africa these days. So yes, humpback whales, but surprisingly rare. Stay whales, we're confident of. Uh, they have they produce calls in these distinctive down sweeps, quite a low frequency, uh, and they occur in these bouts. So it's really low levels of detection, but constantly. Uh, no real overlap in the calls regularly throughout. Quite interesting because there were none seen, but obviously we did pick up all those, those sort of potential say whales further east of Bima. So we're quite confident on this one. 
So minke whales produce a number of unusual sounds, a Star Wars sound of boing and this bioduck, which is also recently described quite nicely by Fanny Shibangu, and he mentioned it in his plenaries. So very distinctive uh, species specific sounds. We're very confident on that these were minke whales, and that was really our, our main focus on this, just sort of notching up species presence. But the information, the data is available if anybody wants to look at it more closely. We didn't have a lot of a uh, lot of encounters, but sort of regularly throughout. More common on the west than the east, and no overlapping uh, calls, suggesting only a few individuals recorded. Now, frustratingly, the whale call that we recorded the most, we couldn't actually identify to species level. It was definitely a baleen whale, based on its characteristics and the sound of it, and how often uh, the spacing of the calls it had a peak frequency of about 130 kilohertz. Occurred in regular bouts. Throughout our recordings, you can see it on both the west and the eastern hydrophone here. And this calls, uh, the calls were about 20 to 30 seconds spacing with no overlap. So we, we did ask around, we extensive literature search, uh, expert consult, and we just couldn't, we just couldn't come to a, conf a firm conclusion. So we, we ended up erring on the side of caution and just calling it unidentified. So the last call type I want to mention is what we ended up calling the unidentified baleen whale song. It literally only occurred for 11 minutes uh, over the entire recording period, much higher frequency than the other call types that we detected, uh, up at around 250 kilohertz. And it had this distinctive sort of a decreasing trend in, in the beginning of the call sequence. And then just series of these upsweeps. So very different. Again, did our best. We just couldn't identify, confidently identify those two species. Hello again. So in summary, uh, we had a small but a useful data set with three or four baleen whales detected acoustically. There was another one we thought might be brooders that didn't present today. There was a striker like a dolphin or a seats in general in this entire cruise. We had uh, very few humpback whales or femur uh, and no song detected, which we found quite unusual given the high number of animals being seen off the Western Cape at this time. And I think this lends support to the dual migration routes down the Belfast Ridge and continental South Africa, and that, that needs review. And for us, it was an exciting finding of this, this big feeding ground of they're being used by the fins and the sow whales. And that's an area that's reachable from Cape Town and definitely merits further investigation. And lastly, we heard more species than we saw. There was also eDNA collected, uh, Jack assisted with that. And that's a separate paper, but it's gonna be really interesting seeing how those results compare to the acoustics and the visual surveys. So frustratingly for us, there were three call types we couldn't identify to species level on despite multiple consultations with regional uh, and, and global baleen whale call specialists, we just ended up with multiple answers. And for us, this is our real take home from this, I think, is that we feel there's a real need for a, a regionally accurate library of, of cetacean calls in general, not just baleen whales, but uh, so based on data that is confirmed, that is recorded locally and there's far too there's a lot of temporal and spatial change in these call types and this is something that we're hoping to move forward with and collaborate with other researchers on so just final slide acknowledgements thanks very much for jack to actually getting out there on the ship and taking on for the team and having all the fun to jack uh, to aaron and to tess for doing the grunt work on the acoustics and to Kirsten for organizing and Tilo for having us on board. So thanks to all involved. And thank you all for listening. Hope you had an enjoyable conference.